Welcome to Get Sleepy, the podcast where we listen, we relax, and we get sleepy. I'm your host, Tom. Thanks for joining us at the start of a new week. Tonight, we'll travel back in time to ancient Mesopotamia to hear one of humanity's greatest and oldest tales the Epic of Gilgamesh. Let's settle into bed and transition away from the day. Tonight's story is both relaxing to listen to and also a fair bit longer than the majority we release on the podcast. So I want to invite you to completely let go of any pressure to fall asleep. Sleep is pretty unique in that unlike most facets of our life, it ought to require as little effort or force as possible. That's not to say the routines we build throughout the day and around bedtime don't deserve our effort because they can significantly help in ensuring we sleep well. But I'm talking about the moments when we're in bed and ready to get some shut-eye. At that time, it's best to keep things as simple and relaxed as we can. Hopefully having a bedtime story read to you might well be the perfect tool for creating that simple and relaxed environment to guide you off to sleep. So, make sure you're comfortable and take a big, deep breath in. Hold for just a moment and enjoy the calming release of the breath as your body and mind let go of any unnecessary energy. Relax deeper and deeper into your bed, taking more of those deep breaths if you'd like, and just Listen along to the sound of my voice. A deep, restorative sleep will soon be yours. But for now, let's head back in time and hear the epic tale of Gilgamesh. There was once a brave king who went on journeys no mortal man had gone on before. One part man and two parts divine, he became the master of wisdom and held knowledge of all things. His name was Gilgamesh. Tonight, we share his 5,000-year-old tale. The city of Uruk was a sprawling metropolis built in the 5th century BCE. The biggest city in the ancient Near Eastern world, it was not challenged in size until Rome was founded several thousand years later. Uruk was the city of King Gilgamesh. The rushing Euphrates River ran just north of the city, where plants grew bountifully. It flowed into town, where it broke into meandering waterways. 
The city was surrounded by tall walls to keep the inhabitants safe. Its mud brick houses dotted the winding streets and canals. People poked their heads out of their windows to hang their laundry to dry and say hello to their neighbors. The clay walls of people's homes mirrored the clay tablets that some of the world's first pieces of art and literature were carved on. One day, Gilgamesh would use these thick clay tablets to write down the stories of his adventures. Canals crisscrossed the city, carrying people in long reed boats with pointed bows. The people cruised up and down the waterways, visiting their friends and family. Traders with food, cloth, gems and stones sold their goods along these channels that connected the massive city to the river and surrounding towns. Artists molded clay bowls and broke ceramic tiles to make mosaics. Paintbrushes swept back and forth on walls. Sculptors created statues, the grandness of which had never been seen in the ancient world before. People walked to the temples, the jewels of the city, carrying offerings for the gods. The sanctuary of Anu, the sky god, and the sanctuary of Inanna, the goddess of love and war, were the beating heart of the city. Each day, the residents of the city made a pilgrimage to the temples to pay homage to the deities and participate in community events. Anu's temple was made from stone and worshippers walked among glistening marble columns a rarity in this city made of mud. Inanna's temple featured mosaic designs, with tiles pressed onto clay cones in mesmerizing geometric shapes. All of the people of Uruk worked together to make the city lively and grand. And as for Gilgamesh, Gilgamesh dreamt. He dreamt of the starry sky above and the gods in the heavens. He dreamt the great sky god, Anu, fell to earth and embraced him. Then he dreamt of a man who looked not so different from himself a bit shorter, a bit wilder, but he recognized a kindred soul. Gilgamesh slept, but a deep part of him knew that his destiny and the destiny of the man he dreamt of were intertwined. Anu and Ninma smiled from the heavens above. The god of the sky and Ninma, the goddess of the earth, knew that ruling was a lonely job. Gilgamesh needed a friend, someone both to challenge and support him. They would create such a man. When Gilgamesh woke, he knew his dream had been of great importance. To have it interpreted, he went to see his mother, the goddess, who was wise in the way of dreams. From the open windows of her room, he could hear the water trickling 
outside the palace walls. Piney scents of river plants wafted in on the breeze. Mother, he said, I have dreamt of a strange man in a strange place. In my dream, Anu himself fell from the sky, and we embraced each other as equals. Then he turned into a man, a wild man, living amongst the animals, but I could tell that he had honor and strength. After he told her the dream, his mother was very quiet. She stood and then walked back and forth, stopping at the window to look out at the expanse of city below. My son, she said, the stars in the sky represent your friends and your people. When the god fell on your shoulders and you embraced as equals, it showed that you are equal to the gods. The man you saw will be your equal too, and a stout-hearted friend. He will never abandon you, and you will never abandon him. He will have the strength of the gods, just as you do, but the love and kindness of a man. Gilgamesh took a deep breath and looked out the window while he thought about what that meant. He could see beyond the city walls where farmers ploughed verdant fields. Mesopotamia, the land between the rivers, was a fertile place. Past the farmland was a golden desert. Ninma brought a rain down on the sand to make clay. From the clay, she moulded the man from Gilgamesh's dream. She made him strong and loving, wild and knowing, the perfect match for Gilgamesh. Enkidu rose from the earth and looked around him. Far from the great city walls of Uruk, all he could see was the hot desert sand. Two bronzed gazelles galloped past him, and he followed, as free and wild as the beasts, until they reached a river. Enkidu drank from the river and ate from the plants nearby. The cool water refreshed him, and the river plants filled his belly. He gazed at the beautiful animals and land all around him, and was happy. But still, he saw the gazelles were a pair, alike to each other. Would he find another like him? One day, a shepherd saw Enkidu drinking by the river. He approached the man to offer him a place to stay for the night, but nearly ran away when he saw him. The man looked almost exactly like the great king Gilgamesh. But this wild man couldn't be his king. He was running with the beasts. The shepherd followed the rushing river to the city. He marveled at how green and lush the land was by the flowing river, in contrast to the dryness of the desert. The sun warmed his skin and danced on the water as he walked, eager to tell his king about the man he had seen. 
When he arrived at Gilgamesh's palace, he told the king his tale. There is a man, he said, who looks just like you, strong and brave and loyal. But he is a wild man. He lives with the beasts. Gilgamesh remembered his dream. Could this be the man he was fated to meet? Gilgamesh followed the shepherd back to the place where he'd seen Enkidu. The river, always present, guided their way. As they got closer, they saw Enkidu drinking with the gazelles. Gilgamesh waved goodbye to the shepherd and tiptoed to the animals so as not to scare them away. When he was close enough, he spoke to Enkidu. He offered him a loaf of bread and some wine to drink. He told him of the great walled city of Uruk, where he could bathe at the temples of Anu and Dinana, and use his strength and courage to go on great adventures. In Uruk, Each day is a revel, my friend. You must join us, Gilgamesh said. Enkidu saw his likeness in Gilgamesh. He ate the bread, delighting in the crispy crust and soft, doughy center. He drank the wine and enjoyed its sweetness much different to the water from the river. But he noticed, as soon as he'd done those things, the gazelles moved away from him. He had transitioned from the world of the animals to that of men. It was time to go with Gilgamesh to the city. The two men, so similar in stature, traced the river back to Uruk's walls. When Enkidu entered the city, his mouth fell open in surprise. It was like nothing he'd ever seen before. Compared to the wilds of the desert where he'd been born, nothing could be more different. Women danced in the streets wearing brightly colored clothes. Musicians banged on drums and tambourines. Children played games on the sidewalks. And farmers sold fresh fruits and vegetables at the market. Smells of freshly baked bread, sweet fruit, cooking stews filled with spices and drying herbs delighted in Kidu's senses. In the desert, life was beautiful, but calm and monotonous. Here, around each corner, Enkidu marveled at a new wonder. Gilgamesh led Enkidu to the temple of Inanna. There, the priestesses bathed him in warm water, scrubbing the sand of the desert and mud of the river from his skin. They cut his hair and helped him shave his beard. They anointed him with sweet-smelling oils and gave him a light woolen tunic to wear. By the time they were finished, he looked just as kingly as Gilgamesh. When Gilgamesh saw him, he grinned, for he knew this was the man 
he had dreamed of. Just like in his dream, he went to Enkidu and pulled him into a hug. Enkidu wrapped his arms around the king. They swore to be each other's most loyal friend from that day on. The two friends passed many days together in Uruk. They attended festivals where they drank ale and ate fragrant foods. Enkidu wanted to try them all. Fried leeks, garlic and eggplant, lentil and barley soup, grilled fish from the river, sprinkled with herbs, roasted nuts, dried figs, and yogurt drizzled with honey. The flavors mingled in Enkidu's mouth, sating the appetite of the man made of clay. They danced to lively music, took trips to the market, and enjoyed the large sculptures, mosaics, paintings, and carvings that adorned the mud walls of the city. They watched with fascination the welders performing lost wax casting to make small bronze sculptures to sell in neighboring towns. And they marveled at the stones and fabrics that merchants brought from far off places. But soon the men started to get restless. Enkidu longed to venture back into nature for a time, to see his friends, the gazelles and the cattle, and to walk along the river. Gilgamesh also yearned for an adventure, to bring back something good for his people. I have wanted to go to the forest of cedars for some time now, he told Enkidu. It is a long journey, for the forest of cedars is far to the west, near the white mountain, Leban. Won't it be hard for you to be away from your people for so long? Enkidu asked. Gilgamesh looked around the city he was so proud to rule. He would be sad to leave, but the pull of adventure was too strong. No matter what I do, I cannot stay in this city forever, he told his friend. One day I will be gone, and my son, and then his son, will rule the city under the guidance of the gods. But if I do something the scribes deem worthy to record, I will live forever through their stories. Enkidu and Gilgamesh packed for their trip. They filled linen packs with dried fruits, nuts, beans, and salted fish. They folded spare shawls to protect themselves from the sun and the wind, and slid an extra pair of wooden sandals into their bags. Before departing, they visited the temples of Anu and Inanna, and asked for protection on their journey. Anu blessed them, and asked Shamash, the sun god, to watch over them in the day. Inanna asked Sin, the moon god, to watch over them at night. Their last stop was to say goodbye to Gilgamesh's mother. She hugged them both glad her son had found such a worthy friend. 
the people waved farewell as the two men left the city. Gilgamesh felt sad to be leaving home, but excited for the journey ahead. Enkidu longed to be back in the wilds, but would miss the comforts he'd grown accustomed to in the city. Outside of the walls, they headed west. They walked through the desert, filling their water casks at any streams they could find. The sun shimmered on the golden sand. Enkidu noticed the footprints of gazelles and smiled, thinking of his first friends. They slept that night under a dark sky speckled with bright stars. The next day, they left the desert and descended into a valley. They quenched their thirst in a clear river and continued on. They climbed over rocky hills covered in shrubs and walked down into green valleys. Up and down they went, the rhythm of their conversation matching the undulation of the landscape. Neither had ever had a friend they could confide in so fully. They shared their fears and hopes and dreams. They talked of the landscape and the food they missed. They held long chats over the campfire and slept beside one another, nodding to sleep each night, entranced by the beauty of the night sky. Finally, they saw the snowy white tip of Laban, and knew they were near the cedar forest. When they turned the next bend in the river, a wall of trees greeted them, They found a small dirt path and followed it through the trees, up the mountain. Wind rustled the leaves like the whispering of secrets between friends. A bird sang, answered by another, and soon the whole forest was filled with birdsong. A solitary tree cricket joined in the chorus. A wood pigeon called, and a turtle dove answered. Monkeys jumped from branch to branch, howling with laughter. The sounds of the forest came together like a band, aiding the men on their journey. When the friends made a fire in the evening, cedar incense lulled them to sleep. Gilgamesh dreamed again that night. He saw a great mountain, taller and whiter even than Laban. When he woke, he told Enkidu of his dream. We are close to the mountain of the gods, Enkidu interpreted. We must go to visit them. Deeper into the forest they walked. The air was cool and fresh. They bathed in icy streams, washing away the dirt from their journey. Then. A wind blew at Gilgamesh, a wind with a message. Welcome from the sun god Shamash. The men thanked Shamash for keeping them safe on their journey and burned cedar incense in his honor. 
Shamash sent gentle breezes behind them, guiding them to the most beautiful parts of the forest. When Gilgamesh dreamed again that night, it was of all the beautiful things the artisans in the city would build with the cedar wood he'd bring back to Uruk. The next day, Gilgamesh and Enkidu loaded a wagon with as much cedar wood as they could take with them. They said their goodbyes to the trees and the birds, the flowers and the monkeys. Over the last few days of camping in the forest, this place had developed a homely feel. Gilgamesh was looking forward to returning to Uruk. But now, being on the road felt just as comforting as lying in his own bed. They retraced their path, walking under the heat of Sharmash and sleeping under the light of Sin. When they returned to Uruk, the people cheered and welcomed them home. A giant feast was prepared for the heroes. They ate roasted lamb, which was warm and hearty, and fell from the bone. A spicy chickpea stew had all the fragrance of home. For dessert, cakes and fruit drizzled in honey appeared on the table before the friends. The people danced and sang, happy that their king had returned with such a bounty. The next morning, Gilgamesh brought the cedar wood to the craftsmen. The artisan's eyes shone when they thought of everything they could build with the finest quality wood. They promised to build a special room for Gilgamesh in his palace to thank him for this wonderful gift. Gilgamesh and Enkidu eased back into the comforts of city life. Each time they went for a boat ride or walked down the city streets, they heard the hammering and sanding of craftsmen making wonderful wooden creations. Soon, the whole city smelled like cedar. But even with all the joys of the walled city, it wasn't long until the two friends itched to go on another adventure together. They sat across from each other at their dinner table one night, sipping their drinks. Where should they go on their next adventure? Was there somewhere to the east they hadn't been yet? Did they dare venture so far as the great land of Egypt, where stone pyramids rose high in the sky. But then, Gilgamesh remembered a story he had heard once as a boy, of the man named Utnapishtim. The legend was that he and his wife lived alone on an island that they had survived the great flood hundreds of years ago, and that they were sorcerers who knew how to live forever. The friends decided they couldn't miss the chance to meet the pair. They prepared for their journey, packing food and clothing, and saying goodbye to their friends. They visited the temples, 
asking for protection from the gods. And lastly, Gilgamesh kissed his mother goodbye as she gave him a blessing for safe travels. Then, once again, the two friends left the city, wandering east this time. They crossed rivers where they cooled their tired feet, walked through jungles where they tasted fresh fruit, and ambled across deserts under the glowing sun. They didn't know exactly where Utnapishtim lived, but each time they went through a town or found a tavern on the side of the path, they stopped to ask if anyone had heard of the man. At first, they were dismissed. The people hadn't heard of him, or they didn't believe he was real. But then, one day, on a deserted road, they came to a small tavern made of old creaking wood. The heroes went inside. The old woman behind the bar was covered with a veil. Underneath the fabric, they could see her twinkling and mischievous eyes. She knew why they'd come. Only those who seek the great sorcerer Come to my tavern, she said in a smooth voice. Stay here tonight. Tomorrow, I will help you find what you seek. The men ate supper with the tavern keeper. She cooked them a hearty meal of roasted boar, spiced sweet potato, sour yogurt, and sliced vegetables. It is a long journey ahead, she told them, handing them a basket of crusty bread. You must keep your strength. They enjoyed a long meal together, sharing stories. The woman told them of all the wayward travelers she met at her inn. Gilgamesh and Enkidu told her of the great city of Uruk, with its walls and waterways, and craftsmen and temples. She could hardly believe a city of such size and grandeur could exist in the world. It was almost as foreign to her as the story of Utnapishtim had been to many of the villagers they'd met on their journey. When the moon shone high in the sky, the woman showed the heroes to their rooms for the night. Sleeping on a soft bed for the first time in weeks, Gilgamesh and Enkidu quickly drifted off into a deep sleep. In the morning, the woman fed them a breakfast of boiled eggs, nuts, and fruit. Then she took them through the back door of her tavern, where water spread out before them. All along, they had been on the coast of a great sea, though from inside the tavern, they hadn't seen its vastness or heard its waves. The blue waters extended to the horizon, and the waves crashed upon the shore. The woman told them to take her boat and sail straight ahead. If Utnapishtim wished to be found, they would find him. They climbed into the reed vessel, feeling the steady rocking beneath their feet. 
unlike the fresh water of the river. The air was salty here. Fish leapt up from below the waves and splashed back under the surface, looking at the strangers paddling through the sea on their narrow boat with a curved bow. The wood paddles felt solid between Gilgamesh's and Enkidu's hands. They soon fell into a steady rhythm, paddling the boat toward the horizon. They were so calm in their rowing that they almost didn't notice the land coming into view like a shimmering mirage ahead of them. As they got closer, they saw a man and a woman standing on the beach. The man had a long white beard, and the woman had glowing white hair. Their wrinkled faces brighted with smiles when they saw the two men approaching. The heroes landed their boat, stepping out into the cool water, which washed their feet clean. They shook hands with Utnapishtim and his wife, who pulled each of them in for a hug. As evening approached, the couple cooked them swordfish over the fire. The flames crackled beneath the setting sun, creating an orchestra with the waves crashing and birds singing. As the fish cooked, Utnapishtim told the heroes his tale. You asked how we have been granted immortal life. The man let out a hearty laugh that warmed Gilgamesh to the soul. We are just like you or any other human on this planet. But I will tell you how we survived the great flood and how we were given the gift of immortality. It was many years ago now. I was still a young man. The great god Ea came to me in a dream. He told me there would be a flood and that I should build a boat out of cedar for my family and my community. Together, my townspeople and I found the wood and built the boat. We worked hard, but it was joyful to do it together. Then we waited, and one day it started to rain. At first, the people were glad. The plants needed to drink and grow, and it had been dry for a long time. But I knew this was the flood I had been warned of. I gathered my people, and we boarded the boat. It was the most delightful form of chaos. Not only did people bring their friends and family, They also brought sheep, goats, cows, gazelles, birds, dogs, cats, and any other animals that would climb aboard the ship with them. The rain pattered on the roof of the boat, which floated easily in the water. No rain could penetrate the strong cedar wood. Soon, the water levels rose higher and higher. Some of the people came outside to feel the cool rain on their skin and taste the fresh water on their tongues. The boat rocked from side to side in the swell. Safe on board, 
the people and animals watched with wonder as water covered the usually parched earth. The flood was a time for everyone to start anew, free from life's daily chores families got to spend more time together. Artists improved their craft and worked together to decorate the inside of the boat. Friends shared meals together. In the evening, we all made music. All the while, the rain played a steady rhythm on the wooden roof. It really was a grand adventure. One day, the rain stopped. Everyone came on deck to see a rainbow of blue, yellow, red, orange and purple mist shining brightly overhead. But before we returned home, I had to make sure the waters had lowered enough. On the first day after the rain stopped, I released a fluttering white dove from the boat. But the dove returned. There was no land for her to perch on. On the second day after the rain stopped, I released a cooing swallow. She too returned, with nowhere else to land. On the third day after the rain stopped, I released a black feathered raven. The raven did not return. It was safe to go home. We celebrated with the rest of our food as we sailed back to the city. Soon, we'd resume our normal lives, but we'd never forget the days we spent together on the cedar ship. Gilgamesh and Enkidu sat on logs around the fire, listening to the tale. They had eaten the fish while the man spoke, but he was not quite finished. It was after we were back home that the gods decided to make my wife and I immortal for the great deed we had done in saving our town, he said. Gilgamesh wanted to become immortal himself. He thought of all he could accomplish for the great city of Uruk. Not all is better when you live forever. So many things in life are sweet because they are fleeting, Utnapishtim said. But seeing the look on Gilgamesh's face, he offered him something else. Take this rosy pink flower and share it with your people. It will help everyone live a long and healthy life. The next morning, Gilgamesh and Enkidu departed. With the flower safely stowed in Gilgamesh's pocket, they rode back to the opposite shore. After hearing the man's tale, The sun felt warmer, the water tasted fresher, and the trees seemed a brighter shade of green than before. They dropped off the boat at the tavern and said goodbye to the woman who'd helped them. They journeyed back across deserts and jungles, mountains and rivers. When they were close to home, 
Enkidu recognized a small, rocky waterfall. It was close to the spot he had been born so many years ago now, where Gilgamesh had found him and brought him to Uruk to be dear friends. The men decided to stop and go for a swim. The water was cool and refreshing, and washed the dust and salt from their long journey off their skin. But while they were swimming, the flower, tucked in Gilgamesh's tunic, was carried away by the wind. From the pool, the men watched the beautiful flower float away. Gilgamesh thought he should feel sad at the loss of this gift for his people. But he didn't. Perhaps Utnapishtim was right. The greatest gift was being able to enjoy each moment, fleeting as it is, for all the beauty and joy it contains. The friends smiled at each other and continued to swim in the cool water. As the sun began to set, they climbed out to dry on the rocks and then walked up the small hill behind the water. From the top of the hill, they could gaze out at the city of Uruk in the distance. Its thick walls sprawled as far as the eye could see. Gilgamesh could make out the tops of the temple, and Enkidu watched the people, tiny from this vantage point, moving around in the city, winding down from their daily deeds getting ready to rest for the night. The pink, orange, and purple of the sunset painted the outsides of the walls and the roofs of houses, making the entire city look like a picture. How wonderful to be alive and to witness this marvel of civilization, they thought to themselves. As the moon made her way into the sky, the friends climbed back down the hill to make camp for the night. They laid out sleeping mats and blankets and built a small fire. From the warmth of their blankets, they thought of their friendship, of all the joyful times they'd shared together, of all the exciting adventures they'd been on, and about how many more adventures they'd have during their lifetime together. Stars glittered in the dark sky above. Shades of black, navy, and white acted as a backdrop to the moon and stars. Just as he was closing his eyes, Gilgamesh saw a comet fly through the darkness. He smiled. The friends could hear the singing of birds and the trickling of the water. The cicadas hummed and a gentle wind rustled through the trees. Tomorrow, they'd return home 
and who knew what the day after that would bring. For now, it was time to drift off to sleep.